Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Today, we're going to hear further evidence from Dr. Smith. So I'm going to ask Dr. Smith to come back into the room, please. Good morning, Dr. Smith. Good morning. All ready to face another day? Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Williams. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the panel. Good morning, Dr. Smith. Um, can we revisit the transcript from yesterday, please? Let's have that up on the screen at day 236, and I'd like to go to page 203. And on 203, uh, if we go, please, uh, to the very first line. In fact, I think we probably need the bottom of 202. Where I, I asked you at 21, what was your own view about the scope and meaning of the new paragraph or the new words in the paragraph? This was 12.7, you'll recall. Uh, and at 25, you say, well, as I've already said, I think, I mean, uh, my understanding was and the way it was conveyed was that it was the material that basically sat between like two sandwich panels or two metal outer layers. So actually, it would also capture what we now know as ACM. You see that? Yes. Uh, now, you, I think, also said yesterday, if you look down, a little bit lower down, uh, that uh, your understanding of diagram 40 was that only the core of a panel had to be of limited combustibility, but not the surface, which could remain class naught or Euro class B. Uh, yes. Yes. Do, can you tell us what, what language, what words in diagram 40 led you to that conclusion? Um you've basically got the shaded areas on the um, diagrams of the building, if you like, and the, um, the, the classes that apply to those shaded. So the presence of class naught? Yes. Right, and the definition and, of class naught? And, and class B, yes. No. Or, or, cla or class B? Yes. Now, when you were told that by... Dr. Colwell, because I think you told us yesterday your understanding of the word filler came from what she told you rather than from an analysis of the language, yes? Yes, correct, right. from discussions. D did you go back and look at diagram 40 just to see how it worked? Um, I don't recall whether I specifically looked at diagram 40 at that moment in time. I don't recall that. Right. C can we look at diagram 40 as it stood in that version, which is the 2006 <coughs> version, uh, which is at CLG at 1607. And if we can go to page 96, please. We can see the the reference to diagram 40 right at the top of, at the top of that page there, within 12.6. Uh, and let's look at the at diagram 40 itself at page 97. There it is. Um, let's, have, let's keep that on the screen. But could we also have up at the same time, please, the previous version of this document, which is CLG 140740. This is, in fact, the 2000 version with the Euro amendments in 2002. And if we can go in that document, please, to page 91. Hmm. You can see them. Um, so what I'm showing you here, just to, be, just to be clear, is on the right-hand side, we've got the 2000 ADB as amended in 2002 to insert the Euro amendments, which we've seen before. And on the left-hand side, we've got diagram 40 as amended in 2006. Now, when you had your conversation with Sarah Colwell, did you examine diagram 40 and notice that the title of diagram 40, as it had stood before the amendment, 
was provisions for external surfaces of walls, but in the 2006 amendment had turned into provisions for external surfaces or walls. Did you notice that at the time? I don't recall noticing that at the time, no. Did anybody bring the fact of that change to your attention, even if you didn't read it yourself on the page? Um, no. Do you remember having any discussion about that change with anybody at the department or within the RE? No, I don't. But before I showed it to you a minute or two ago, had you ever noticed that um, difference? Potentially after, uh, well, the time I would, did notice it was after the Grenfell Tower fire. Right. And at that stage, did so anybody... Pre, sorry. And at that stage, did anybody give you an explanation of the um, change? No. Did you ask for one? Um, not specifically, no. Did you ask for one in a non-specific way? Um, no. Right. Do you now, sitting there, have any insight into the reasons for that change? No, I don't. Do, do, do you remember any kind of conversation with Brian Martin or anybody else at the department about how 12.7, with the word filler in it as you understood it from your conversation with Sarah Colwell, could sit consistently with diagram 40 on the left-hand side? of the screen? Um, no. Uh, uh, and I ask you that because the title, Provisions for External Surfaces or Walls, might very well suggest uh, that after tw 2006, Diagram 40 w would apply to the entire wall. Yes, I can understand what you're saying. Did you ever consider the rationale behind requiring the core of a composite panel at the rain screen to be of limited combustibility, as you told us yesterday you had understood it after 2006, but allowing the surface to remain class naught only. Did I understand the rationale? Yes. Um, well, my understanding was, I think as I explained yesterday, that the... Um, the Class O requirement, or Class B, was to capture coatings of materials. So, you know, it's very commonplace for um, different types of elements, the rain screen elements, for example, or indeed renders, to have surface coatings applied to them. Um, for protection, so you know that could be paints or or whatever, plastic coatings, whatever, and um, you know what you want to ensure is that they do not rapidly spread flame over the entire surface of that external wall. Um, so you know it's a it's nevertheless an important parameter that also needs to be controlled. What was the purpose of requiring the core of a composite panel to be of, of limited combustibility, or, or in, in, in the Euro-class regime, A1 or A2, mm -hmm. but the surface, the coating, as you, you call it, uh, only to be class naught or class B under the Euro-class regime? So, I mean, typically the surface coatings are very thin, but can nevertheless spread the flame a distance. So then they don't contribute a um, significant amount of heat for necessarily a very long time, but they can still allow a flame and a fire to spread from point A to point B. Yeah. And so, you know, you want to prevent that. They yeah. wouldn't necessarily be a long-lasting fire that, that would, um, you know, sit there and, and burn for a very long time, but you get this almost like, you can get like a, in the single burning item test, you, you can see a flash of flame across the surface of, of a material. What was the logic of requiring the core to be of limited combustibility, but, but allowing the coating to be of a lower combustibility standard? All pretty much 
the protective coatings that you would apply to the surface of um, external walls are in their own right organic and have organic content within them. Um, and the reality is uh, that, or well, my understanding is that the reality is that there are very few um, external coatings that you would be able to apply that would indeed meet the limited combustibility criteria. You know, they, paints are, they have um, coloured pigments in them, etc., which are generally organic based. And therefore, the risk associated with a thin sort of surface coating on a material is not considered to be as great, provided you restrict it in terms of the um, extent to which it can spread flame and fire. So does that tell us that the rationale for a lower standard of combustibility on the external surface was not uh, the desirability of having a lower standard, but simply the nature of the products to which class naught or class B would uh, would be applied. Um, I guess that's the the rationale because obviously that had existed and pre-existed for a long time, and um, it was deemed to be commensurate with the risk and the types of um, behaviours that had been and were being um, observed from the. Um, the statistics, etc. But class naught didn't only apply to paint, did it? It, it? it applied to all kinds of surfaces, yes, such as coatings. HPL, aluminium, steel. Well, the, the outer coatings and surfaces yeah. on those. Well, well y yes. yes. But with an ACM panel specifically, or an HPL panel specifically, mm -hmm. you've got an outer coating, which isn't paint, it's a, um, a material. A, a solid material, not an applied liquid. So what I'm really trying to understand is, is why class naught was thought, was thought appropriate to continue to apply, notwithstanding that the, the core was of limited combustibility, even in cases where the outer skin, if I can put it that way, might be aluminium or HPL or some other kind of plastic. So, I mean, as I say, the the rationale, as I've always understood it, was that those materials um, on the outer surface are generally a thin coating that has the potential to spread the flame from point A to point B. And what you're trying to do is control the speed with which it can do that and the extent to which it can do that and that the class O or the class B classification for those um, surfaces is, is how that is done. Given the views that you espoused, as you told us about during the course of your evidence earlier, about class naught as, as unsuitable as a classification, and given how that was proven both in the um, Connolly tests and indeed the CC1924 tests that BRE carried out, in 2001, uh, why would class naught be acceptable at all on the surface, given that the surface is more immediately prone to primary attack by fire? So the um, comments made in relation to class O previously were about the performance of the system, and it was very clear that the class O in its own right was not controlling the hazard associated with the whole of the external wall makeup. I mean, obviously, what's in um, the approved document here is one particular aspect of a package of measures that are being applied to the external wall makeup. That's my understanding. What was your understanding before 2006? about how class naught uh, worked together with 12.7? I can't recall sat here right now. Was it your view before, 12, before 2006 that, as you put it, um, the entire external wall makeup was required to be of limited combustibility? Um, I would have to go back and look. I can't remember what, what, what we discussed previously, but 
But it's on, it, we can do is, that. Is that what the um, approved document required? I, I, well, we sorry. can look at it. It's on the screen, in fact, on your yeah. right-hand side. And if you'd like to go back a, a two pages to page 89, we can see yes, okay. the wording. Uh, but, um, that's fire resistance. Page 90, I think, is where we have um, external services under 3.5. External surfaces of walls should meet the provisions in diagram 40. However, the total amount of combustible material may be limited in practice by the provisions for space separation. And then you've got the note, as we saw before, introducing the alternative route to compliance, which was compliance with BRE 589. And then you've got 13.6, the outer cladding of a wall of rain screen construction with a drained and ventilated cavity, the surface of the outer cladding which faces the cavity should also meet the prov provisions of diagram 40. And then 13.7, which became 12.7 in the next edition. Yes. Which we can see there. Yes. In, in so, the second sentence. Yes. So, I mean, my understanding is based on, or would have been based on what was actually written here and that the limited combustibility um, criteria applies as, as described in the second paragraph of 13.7. Yeah, but to taking that second paragraph and looking at the provisions of this version as a whole, what was your own understanding about whether or not the entire external wall build-up had to be comprised of materials of limited combustibility? Did it or didn't it, to the best of your understanding at the time? Well. So I can't recall exactly, but reading this now, I can't see why my view would have been that the whole wall needed to be made up of limited combustibility materials. We, we also see, while we're on it, let's pick this point up, at 13.7, there's a prior paragraph which says this, the external envelope of a building should not provide a medium for fire spread if it is likely to be a risk to health or safety the use of combustible materials for cladding framework or of combustible thermal insulation as an overcladding or in ventilated cavities may present such a risk in tall buildings, even though the provisions for external surfaces in diagram 40 may have been satisfied. What did you understand that to be telling the reader? That you need to comply with both. Isn't it telling you that even though you comply with diagram 40, uh, the, the, the presence of combustible thermal insulation, either in the overcladding or in ventilated cavities, may present a risk of fire spread. Yes, and that yeah. you need to comply with the provisions yeah. in, in, in both parts. Did there come a time when you noticed that that part I've just read to you disappeared from approved document B? I don't recall. Um, I mean, clearly, I'm aware of that now, but I don't recall at what point I was aware of that, no. So can we, just standing back from the detail then of these documents, is your evidence to us that from 2006 or seven, when you had this discussion with Sarah Colwell about the, in, the impact of the amendments to approve document B and the insertion of the word filler, that you believed that the effect of ADB as amended was to require a limited combustibility core and a class naught coating. Yes. Were you then dis shocked to discover later that combustible materials were still being used in facades? Yes. When did you discover that? When it all became apparent after the Grenfell Tower fire. It became apparent as to what had been going on and what the makeup of the external wall at Grenfell Tower was, and it was one of absolute shock and wondering how on earth that could have happened and that could have been permitted and interpreted in the way that it clearly had been. Can we go to BRE 3013295, please? Now, I don't need to trouble you with the context of this, other than to say that this appears to be an internal 
uh, email exchange between a number of people within the BRE <coughs> about a, a, a proposed meeting with the NHBC F management board. Uh, I don't think we need to examine the details of that. What I'd like to ask you about is the top email on that first page there, mm -hmm. which is from you to uh, Oliver uh, Novakovic, Deborah Pullen, Nick Jones, and Gary Timmins, copied to Kim Lofting. Yeah. The subject is proposals for the NHBC Foundation. And it says, Debs, who I think is Deborah Pullen, because yes. she's... Yes. Uh, one of the, the people who originated the email chain. We could put a proposal on, in on, a, on building separation distances for fire safety related to increased compartment temperatures due to highly insulated buildings and combustible facades stroke roofs. Do you have a template for, for the outline or do you just need a paragraph? Perhaps we can discuss when we meet tomorrow morning. Now, can you just explain what you mean there by your reference to combustible facades? Um... Yes, I think this was referring to the increasing trend that we were seeing coming from the sustainability goals and so on that were being adopted within buildings. We were starting to see green roofs, we were starting to see green walls, um, and of course highly insulated buildings. And there was a concern that um, we didn't know, but I mean, you think, well, what impact could this potentially have in terms of the guidance that is currently there? So there's a document, BR187, that relates to um, separation distances. And we wanted to um, be able to carry out some research to better understand the impact of these types of um, developments that we were seeing. Um, Within the, within the built environment. And um, the, the bit about the highly insulated buildings was what, what was the impact of that in terms of the internal compartment temperatures. And so, but without the research and without the funding to do that, we couldn't carry out any sort of systematic um, analysis to better understand that and to understand the implications that that would have on on um, the guidance that was in BR 187. Why are you even discussing combustible facades in circumstances where your understanding was that there couldn't be any because of your reading of approved document B? But somehow they were finding their way into the market. There so, are buildings with green walls. So, so how were they being utilised and developed? So this was part of an overarching piece of research. It wasn't just focused on combustible facades. It's looking at the whole the whole package in the round and some of the trends that appeared to be um, occurring. When did you first discover that combustible facades were finding their way into the market? Um, I don't recall that. I mean, it would have been based on what people were observing you know, in their walking around, um, walking around the street. Right. So, and you walked around the street, presumably. Yes, of course. And you would have observed, did you, that there were combustible facades out there, notwithstanding the provisions of approved document B, as you understood it? Yes, I mean, and I think, um, so like the green walls, um, we, I think we actually had a um, green wall that had been erected on site at BRE in what was the Innovation Park. And, you know, it was a point of discussion amongst the fire, the fire group. Yes. I mean, what I'm really trying to understand is why it, was, it came as such a shock to you after the Grenfell Tower fire to discover that there were combustible facades out there when you're now telling us, based on this document, that you'd known that at least since 2012. It was, uh, well... In this context, it was within a different um, scenario. And by that, I mean so combustible facades. Clearly, if something has been submitted for test and has been classified to BR135, there may be some element of combustibility within that, as, as we know. Um, so render systems, for example, may have an encapsulated combustible element within them. Um, and so it's referring in a very generic sense to the types 
of trends that were going on there. So just to try to find this down a bit, what was it that you discovered in uh, June 2017 after the Grenfell Tower fire and thereafter about combustible facades that you didn't know in 2012 when referring to combustible facades? Okay, so the key, the key thing in relation to the Grenfell Tower fire from my perspective and that of colleagues when we discussed it was centred around, firstly, you've got a combustible insulation in combination with ACM, with a combustible core. Now, according to the guidance and our understanding of the guidance that was in ADB in the 2006 version, that did not comply with any of the um, guidance that is included in 12.6 to 12.9. Therefore, that should have been tested and classified in accordance with BR135 before it had been permitted for use on the tower. And we, at that time, were not aware and had not seen any evidence, certainly um, nothing that we had done, um, at BRE, of course, it was always possible, right, that, that some testing might have been done elsewhere, but there was nothing that we had that evidenced and supported the use of that system on the tower. Right. Um, that's what that, you know, that's really what that related to. Let's see. Well, let me just see if I can get at it one more time this way. In and after 2012, and we see your reference there to combustible facades. What kinds of combustible facades did you think did comply? And what kinds of combustible facades did you think didn't comply? The only combustible facades that did comply or could comply would be those that had been tested and classified to BR135. Then why would they be a concern? such as would warrant increased uh, con um, a proposal about fire safety related to increased compartment temperatures due to combustible facades? Why would that be a problem? Well, we didn't know that that's why you do the research. You think there could potentially be a problem, and I say, and it also related to the growing use of green walls, and what were the potential implications of for example, one of the discussions with colleagues was a green wall becoming a brown wall because it's no longer maintained and, you know, the vegetation dies and so on. And that was certainly something that was being looked at as well in the context of roofs. Well, what I'm really seeking to get from you is what you, what you thought was out there in the built environment. Uh, did you think that what was out there was um, combustible facades <coughs> which uh, didn't comply with the linear route uh, but did comply with 8414 and the BR135, or did you think that there were combustible facades out there which complied with neither? No, there was not a belief that there were combustible facades out there that complied with neither. So therefore your reference here can only be, is this right, to combustible facades which have passed an 8414 test to BR135? Was that what you thought? Well, with the exception of the one that I've just re referenced specifically in, in green walls, you know, we have never carried out, to my knowledge, a BS8414 test on a green wall. So knowing that there was actually some of that starting to appear out there in the built environment, then as um, in terms of looking and wanting to better understand these things and carry out research so that the understanding is there, that, that's the purpose of that. So you're trying to deal with things before they become a significant issue and also make sure that the guidance that is provided in terms of a BRE document, BR187, is still robust and, and relevant. That was the purpose of this proposal. Right. Or, or this... Um, yeah, I mean, a proposal, I think, did go in, but it wasn't successful. Right. Uh, when you were presented, or when somebody, or if somebody had come along to you and presented you with a piece of ACM with a polyethylene core, 
Uh, how would you test it to make sure that it complied with diagram 40? What would you do? You would have to test it um, either to the through the BS 476 part 6 and 7 route or through the European um, classification route to and you would test it using um, the small flame test and the single burning item test. And what would you be testing exactly? The sample as provided. I mean, in the context of the European tests in particular, you would want you would have to understand a little bit about its end use application or intended end use application, because you have to include that um, information within the classification report. And under BS four seven six part six, the manufacturer comes along to you or the builder comes along to you and says, "I'm about to buy uh, a lot of this." Um, ACM with a PE core to put on a tall building. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to know what it is I have to test to get class naught, please. What do I do? What would you tell them? Um, what would you have told them in 2007? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't have been involved in telling no, them but, anything. But, but, but as the expert in this sort of thing. Um, my colleagues, I think, would have said um, you, you need to do BS 476 part 6 and part 7. Um, again, you would have a discussion with them about whether the intended use involved um, an air gap behind the product or not, because you test it accordingly with an air gap directly behind it or against um, a substrate. And depending upon the type of substrate, you, there, there are several options for those standard options that, that, that are used with those. Um, and, and that's basically the, the discussion that you would have. I mean, it's very unlikely that um, the scenario that you described would actually happen where somebody would come and say, I'm going to buy a lot of this and I'm going to okay. use it in this way. Yes, of course. Yes. And I'm really putting to you a, 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 <clears throat> a theory uh, to you uh, as a scientist. Now, if that were to happen you, and you were presented with a composite product... A mm -hmm. composite rain screen product of the kind I've just yes. described to you. What is it that you would be testing to BS 476, part 6 and 7, in, in order to obtain class naught? Yes, it's the product. The whole thing? The, yes. Including its core? Yes. But of course, class naught doesn't apply to the core, does it? Well, only insofar as you are that the whole sandwich, if you like, is in the sample holder and is exposed behind the aluminium sheet to, um, to the heat source during the test. So the extent to which it contributes to the classification is dependent upon the way that the sandwich in its entirety performs yes. within, the, within the test. Yes, but the test is not to test the core, it's to test the surface, because that's what diagram 40 requires, isn't it? But it's a product that is being placed on the market as a product, so you don't strip it apart and test the individual elements. So was it your understanding that there was such a thing as a class naught product? Um, yes, I mean, for, an, for a high-pressure laminate, for example, that equally is a product but of course what you're exposing is the external mm. surface does it make sense to refer to a composite panel with a pe core uh, as a class naught product um well i'm not sure you would refer to it as a class naught product would you not i mean what what the test reports and the classifications say. They will describe the product that was tested and how it was tested and they will say that the classification applies to that, that product. But the classification by definition only applies to the surface according to paragraph 13 of Appendix A and class naught. Well it does apply to the surface because that is really what is being tested but equally I think as we spoke about earlier if you had a product that came to you that had a very thin um, surface and during the course of the part seven test, for example, the fire burnt through that thin surface, then you inevitably are testing 
the, the, the substrate or the, the other component of that product that sits behind it. You don't stop the test and say, well, we don't need to, we don't need to continue with this. Right. So if something burnt off the surface very quickly um, and then exposed something behind and then you got um, spread of flame on that component within the um, product behind, you would still continue with the test and that would form part of the classification. Right. So in fact what gets classified is a composite product, the surface of which has been tested to class naught. Yes. Do you think that's plain from the language of ADB? Did, did you always think that that was plain from the language of ADB? It's not something that I'd specifically right. considered. I, to me, it was always clear what, what the tests were doing. Um, and I don't recall having had any discussions with, um, with anybody about confusion around that. Let's, um, let's see how we go into the history of this, because we'll come back to this topic in due course when we see some later documents. Can we um, go to January 2014? Uh, Dr. Smith, the inquiry has heard some evidence from earlier witnesses that a meeting took place on the 30th of January 2014 between Sarah Colwell, Tony Baker and Brian Martin. And by January 2014, Brian Martin was the department's principal construction professional. That was his title okay. by then, I think. Mm -hmm. And we've been told that the purpose of the meeting was to discuss paragraphs 12.6 and 12.7 of approved document B. My first question is, do you know anything about that meeting other than what's been said in the inquiry? No, I don't. Did you not know about it at the time? Not that I can recall, no. Did Sarah Colwell not report back to you about it? Not that I can recall, no. What about Tony Baker? Did he? No, not that I can recall. Right. Uh, now, there's, there was some correspondence which led to the meeting in January being arranged, January 2014, between the BRE and Brian Martin. And that happened in November 2013. Uh, your colleagues, Tony Baker, Sarah Colwell, and Stephen Howard were all copied into that correspondence. Again, did you, you didn't see that correspondence, did you? Not that I'm aware of, no. Let's take a look at it, um, and just to see if it prompts a recollection. It's CLG 1005895. Uh, and if we scroll down in the email run, please, to page two, we can see that there's an email of the 25th of November at the bottom of the screen from Tony Baker to Brian Martin, copied to Sarah Colwell and Stephen Howard, subject ADB clause 12.6 and 12.7. Uh, and at the second paragraph, uh, it says, I hope this, I hope you can help with the following. We're seeing an increasing number of inquiries which were being asked for our opinion stroke interpretation of diagram 40 and ADB B4 clauses 12.6 and 7 in relation to the build-up of systems using board finishes. And we would like to reach a general understand, general understand so we can respond to all parties in the same way. Now, just pausing there, does this trigger a recollection? about either seeing this email run or having a discussion internally with any of the people on this email? It doesn't. Now, uh, in her statement, Sarah Colwell says, let's look at that, it's BRE 3 series 47571, page 61, paragraph 385, please. BRE 3 series 47571, page 61, paragraph 385. She says, Uh, this uh, at 385. Uh, as far as I can, re we need, I think, to go back to 60 to see the question. Uh, and the question is at A, at the very top of the page, it says, prior to sending this email, which is a reference to the one we've just looked at, what discussions, if any, had taken place on this matter within the BRE? And then there are various other questions. Between, one of which is between whom, and then if we turn the page to page 61, by whom was this decided? As far as I can recollect, she says, this decision was reached between Tony Baker, Stephen Howard, Debbie Smith, and myself. Uh, and she confirmed that fact 
when she gave oral evidence at day 233 to the inquiry last week. What do you say about that? Is it right that the decision to send this email was reached uh, between those people and you? I don't recollect that. Um, if I had been involved in the discussions, I would have expected to have been CC'd in on the email anyway. Um, what, I, what I would say is, I mean, it was generally understood, and it may be around that that Sarah is um, referring, that you know, it was generally understood that BRE's role was not to provide an interpretation of the approved document um, directly, and that any such interpretation needed to come from government department, whether it's about um, clauses 12 or, or any other clauses within the approved document. Um, and, you know, it may be that, that overarching um, issue that um, Sarah is is referring to there, but I, I I don't recall being involved in the detailed discussion around this, and I think if I had been, then I would have been cc'd in on the email that went to Brian. Was there any particular reason why you wouldn't have been involved in those discussions? Well, I mean, I, I had a team um, of people that were working to me at the time which were covering a whole wide range of different activities and I was not involved and could not be involved in all of the day-to-day -day discussions that went on. I mean, just it's not physically possible. So it's done more by um, exception or if there was a particular thing that they weren't sure what to do or, or where to go with something that they would, they would bring things to me. Yeah. Um, but no, I would not be having day-to-day -day discussions on every facet of the work that we were undertaking across the whole, the whole group that I was responsible for. But was this not one of those things that was a particular thing they weren't sure what to do with or where to go with? It's a communication with government um, about the meaning of an important part of approved document B. I, I can't speak for that. Right. Do you remember yourself whether Brian Martin discussed this email and the, or the point in it with you at the time? I don't, but I mean, it would be unlikely that he would have done. I mean, he would be talking directly to um, Sarah, Tony or, or Steve. Do you know what the inquiries were that the BRE had been receiving to which Tony Baker refers on the interpretation of Diagram 40 and 12.6 and 12.7? No, I don't. You don't know anything about that? Is I that don't right? know what they, what they were, no. Right, OK. Um, sticking with Sarah Colwell's statement, please, at page 60, if we can go back to that. At paragraph 382, she says, the discussions would have been within the passive fire team. I was not working in this team on a day-to-day -day basis, and so I was not aware of the full extent of the discussions within the team. But from memory, I believe that Tony Baker and Stephen Howard and Debbie Smith were aware of these discussions. Is she right about that, to the best um, of your recollection? What, what are these discussions that are being referred to? Well, the here? discussions that led to the email being sent. Um, I'm not aware that I was involved. Um, again, Tony Baker and Steve Howard and the broader Pacifier team may well have discussed those. Were you aware, even in a general sense, of uh, an increase in queries about the meaning of diagram 40 and paragraphs 12.6 and 12.7? Not specifically, no. Not specifically, but what about generally? Were you even um, generally aware that there was a rising chorus of concern? No, I don't believe I was. Um, let's go back to Tony Baker's email, if we can please, at CLG 1005895 page two, and let's look on. Uh, the second and third bullet points say this. Uh, 12.6 guidance references diagram 40 in relation to the classification of the finish, which would be acceptable over 18 metres as being BS3D2, but 12.7 talks about insulation or filler materials which make up the wall being limited combustibility. And then he says this. As the minimum stroke maximum surface finish is not defined, a debate has opened up within the industry as to whether or not the boards can be called the finish or the filler. Now, 
Did you know that a debate had opened up within the industry about that? No, I didn't. Did nobody even hint to you at any time at this time within the BRE that there was this question which had arisen within the industry about filler? Not that I can recollect, no. If we go to page three, final paragraph, Tony Baker says, based on our experience from the original PII programme, we would suggest that, that a definition of the surface finish thickness and filler would assist in clarifying this point and would therefore be grateful for your thoughts. Now, f first, what was meant by the original PII programme? Do you know? Um, I don't know. I, I would anticipate that it was the original work that was done um, at Cardington in the 1990s. That led to Fire Note 3? Uh, yes. Yes, that's what yes. Sarah Colwell says in her witness statement in paragraph I, 408. Yeah. But, and what was the BRE's experience from that programme which was relevant here? I'm not entirely sure. I'm, I'm not as familiar with that as um, Sarah would be, for example. Right. Now, this is uh, January, or, sorry, November 2013. Uh, at that stage, on, on the basis of what you knew and what you thought, did you think that a definition of filler would assist, as Tony Baker suggests? Well, I say I don't remember discussing this with them, but, I mean, it's a very sensible suggestion. By this time, November 2013, had your own understanding changed or developed from the understanding that you had in 2006 stroke 7 when Sarah Colwell told you what filler meant? Um, no, I think that was still my right. understanding. Can you explain why the BRE was still trying to reach a general understanding about this question, the meaning of filler and the meaning and ambit of 12.6 and 12.7 in November 2013? Um, no, I can't. So I, I, I'm hearing from the answers you've been giving me that you knew nothing whatever about the debate, about the questions, or, or about their own perceived need for clarification. Not that I can recollect at the time, no. Who was the person within the BRE at this time, late 2013, who was the a, a, account holder or points person within the BRE so far as government was concerned? We didn't have one. You didn't have one. You had been one, hadn't you? Yes, but you had been the person that think, only August. existed during the course of the framework. And f once the framework concluded in 2011-2012, um, all projects were thereafter um, tendered in right. a completely open way. And, you know, there was no commitment to there being any, nevertheless, um, or, or indeed being many. And at right. that point, there was no, no purpose in having a framework Clearly, there was no framework to have a framework manager. Yeah. Um, did, did others in the BRE then develop into points people, points of, points of immediate contact, as between government and the BRE, instead of you? Um, yes, of course. I mean, people had a new um, Brian Martin and were able to, um, you know, speak, speak to Brian. In, and, and or on a daily basis, informally, if they had a query? Is that, is that how it worked? Yeah, or? I mean, we, we had no, no rules around that. Right. If people felt the necessity to speak to Brian about something, then it was down to their own, um, their own um, needs, if you like, to, um, to, to, to speak to him or to communicate with him, uh, as Tony has done here in, in the email. Right. Let's, um, uh, let's go up to the next email in the chain on page two. And you can see Brian Martin's response that uh, on the 25th of November, same day, uh, at 1547. So um, about half an hour later. Uh, and uh, in, you can see what he says there. Hi, Tony. I, I see where you're coming from. The problem we have with Class B is that you can have a thin surface that gives you the performance and back it with something less desirable. So there's no such thing as Class B material. The word filler was introduced because of a particular incident where a polymeric foam was used to keep an aluminium panel stiff. The foam was not used for thermal reasons, so it wasn't, quotes, insulation. 
close quotes, exclamation mark. It's still burned, of course, three exclamation marks. Sarah will remember the details, I'm sure. I'm thinking out loud here, but I think a homogenous Class B board would be fine, effectively a Class B material, question mark. But a lamination of board with something else should revert to the limited combustibility criteria. Does this make sense? Don't quote me on this yet. What do you think? Now, were you... I, I, I detect I know the answer to this question, but I feel I should put it to you. Were you aware in November 2013 that Brian Martin himself was still, as he put it, thinking out loud about the scope and meaning of these paragraphs of approved document B and not wanting to be quoted on it yet? No, I wasn't. Or, or, or did you know that Brian Martin was asking Tony Baker and with Sarah Colwell and Stephen Howard copied in what he thought about whether a homo homogenous class B board, as he puts it, would be fine? No. If you'd been asked this question in November 2013, what would your answer have been? I would not, I don't think, have agreed with um, that a homogenous Class B board would be fine um, because it's all about how you would then write the guidance and define that. Can, are you able to explain how government thought it would be? No, I can't. And why would a homogenous Class B not be fine? Well, I say it's down to how you would actually define that in a way that made any sense. And, and, um, and where would readers of approved document B discover that a, a homogenous Class B panel would not be fine? Well, I mean, if, if they decided they were going to make a change to this effect, then it would have to be incorporated within the approved document and it would have to be properly, um, you know, the guidance would have to be clear. No, sorry, uh, let me try again. Uh, how would a reader know that a homogenous panel would not be fine? Sorry, a reader of what, though? Reader of approved document B, Dr Smith. But it isn't fine. Well, I know. Yes. How would a, somebody picks up approved document B, reads 12.6, 12.7 and diagram 40, how would they know? What words in that would tell them that a homogenous Class B board would not be fine, as you understood it? Um, well, I've explained the way that I understand Diagram 40 and that it refers to the surface. Well, I'm puzzled about this the because product. if you've got an homogenous Class B board, the surface is by definition Class B, isn't mm. it? It is. Now, um, if you look at 12.7, 12.6, 12.7 and Diagram 40... What is it in the language that's there used which tells you that although your board has a class naught surface, it is not suitable for use uh, in the exterior wall? Um, well, insofar as you can potentially test that... Um, sorry? I, I'm, I'm not actually talking about testing. I'm talking about the language of the... Approved document. Yes, but it, it relates back to what you're actually physically testing yes. in order to achieve the classification. Yes. So the two are, you know, intimately bound together, of course. And that's what I was referring to earlier as well about, <clears throat> you know, whether you test with an air gap or, or against a substrate and so on. Um, with all of these things, you, you have to look at what you've done and how you've done it. Um, in order to define the field of application that that applies to. So you would need to think very carefully about um, how, if you were going to change the guidance, how you would change the guidance. No, I'm sorry, perhaps we don't understand each other. Sorry. This, this is not a question about changing the guidance. Mm -hmm. I think Mr Millett's question is this. If you have a board which has been demonstrated to be Class B, and it's an homogenous board, what is it in the language of ADB as it stands, or as it stood at the time, that tells you that it is not suitable for use on the exterior of a high-rise building? So you're talking here, and I, okay, so I think I'm starting to understand where you're coming from now. So 
in terms of a homogenous board, you're talking about a board that is consistent in its makeup throughout um, and doesn't have a surface um, coating added to it, whatever. Um, so yes, in principle, a class B board that is homogenous throughout in that respect and has achieved a class B mm -hmm. um, would comply with what is required in diagram 40. Yes, but how would it then comply with 12.7 as you understood it? Um, it wouldn't. So exactly, we have it. You yes. could have, therefore, this tension, don't you, between 12.7, as you understood it, and class naught, as you understood it. Yes. Mm. How did you resolve that tension in your mind? Well, you have to comply with, 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 both, with both pieces of the, the guidance. Well, huh, the problem with both pieces of the guidance is that one is telling you, 12.7, is telling you that it has to be A1 or A2, You're using the Euro classes, for example, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and diagram 40 is telling you that it need only be B, which is it? Well, I mean, my personal opinion would be, but I mean, it would be for the department to potentially um, issue further guidance around that, would be that you, you need to comply with the highest mm. level of requirements. Well, that's... You can't just pick and choose and say, well, I've met that one, therefore that's okay. If you've tested and, and shown that, you're, um, that, that you've got class B, but then equally the guidance in 12.7 says that it needs to be um, limited combustibility. <coughs> you can't use the fact that you've got class B as demonstrating that you're complying with the limited combustibility requirement in 12.7. Yes, and what you've just told us, was that something that you learnt or could have learnt after Sarah, well, Sarah Colwell told you what filler meant in 2007? Presumably it was. Um, I mean, I've not thought about it in the context that we've just discussed it. Yeah, my question before. is, why not? It, it wasn't something that um, had ever been raised or, or discussed. But what you've just told us is exactly the reason why I asked you yesterday. But when Sarah Colwell told you about the meaning of 12.7 after the amendment, what, did you go back and check how it was consistent with Diagram 40? Because had you done so, I think you would accept now that you would have realised uh, the anomaly which you've just identified. But again, I mean, I don't regard that particularly, okay, it is an anomaly, yes. but it does not avoid the need to comply with both of the paragraphs. And I don't think, I mean, my view would be that somebody that achieves a class B cannot then comply with the requirements in 12.7. And just because they've got a class B, they still have to meet the requirements in 12.7 as well. I say it's not an either or. But do you think the difficulty for the reader, who's got the class B board, mm -hmm. when he looks at 12.7, he doesn't see anything there other than the word filler mm. to tell him that the class B board is not suitable? And he might say, well, there's no filler involved here. Mm. So it doesn't apply. Is it, is it, isn't that one of the difficulties? Potentially. Um, I mean, what we're, what we're considering now is whether the guidance in clauses 12.5 to 12.7 was actually clear enough. And I guess benefit of hindsight, now knowing what we all know about the way that people have interpreted this, then the answer to that is, well, clearly it wasn't. Did you have any inkling at the time, late 2013, uh, that government, Brian Martin, viewed this, viewed the interpretation of ADB differently from how you had viewed it for the previous seven years? Um, in 2013? Mm. Um, I, I had no idea. Right. Now let's go uh, back up to uh, page one of this email run, please, to Tony Baker's email the 3rd of December, a week or so later. Uh, and uh, he, he starts by saying, uh, hi, Brian, and I'm sorry, it's the second email down. And, and in the second sentence, he says, it is an interesting issue and one we need to resolve one way 
or another. Um, now, at the time, did, did you know that there was at least an issue that needed to be resolved by government in this respect? Um, not that I was aware of, no. Or between government and the BRE? No. no. Going on to the next paragraph, he says, Euroclass B S3D2 has the potential to propagate flame either as a surface coating or as a homogenous product, and more so if both surfaces are exposed, which in the case of systems with these boards can be the case, as they in invariably have a cavity between the board and insulation. D do you agree with that? Um, yes, I mean, I guess he's referring here to sort of rain screen type systems. Mm. And then it goes on, the PII and DCLG cladding projects used board systems. Looking at the data, the systems appear to have achieved a range of indicative B and C Euro classes, depending on substrates and fixings, etc. When these systems were tested to BS8414 in the five tests, none met the performance criteria in BR135. Now, uh, it, it, those PII and DCLG cladding projects, that's a reference, I think, isn't it, to the experimental testing program carried out uh, under contract CC 1924 in 2001, which we've examined. Um, I guess he's considering a broader range of the evidence because he's referring to the PII project right. as well, which but was obviously the 1996. Final three. Well, uh, all right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and then he goes on to say, this would suggest to me that clause 12.6 and hence diagram 40 is appropriate for surface co surfaces coatings in the context of a decorative render finish, i.e. a non-substantial component scenario, burns off and doesn't propagate flame through the system, with the remaining system re requiring limited combustible materials as 12.7 or the system to meet BR135 as 12.5. Now, um, the words that would suggest to me um, is what he says, but do you, did you or would you, do you agree with what he goes on to say in his thinking? Um. Okay, I mean, he's saying that it's appropriate for those systems. He's not saying what it's not appropriate for. So it's really only part of the issue, I think, that he's discussing there. Right. Again, to the uh, foot of the email, he says, as you say, thinking out loud, we probably need to discuss in order to fully resolve. Would it be possible to arrange a meeting to discuss further? And then the response to that is at the top. If we scroll up to the top of um, page one, please, in, in the, on the screen. You can see Brian Martin coming back to him the same day, um, four minutes later, five minutes later, um, saying, happy to have a chat, probably not this side of Xmas. I think it's important to remember that we never expected the ADB rules to result in a system that would always pass the BR135 criteria. Now, I, I, uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to interpret um, his language, that's for him to tell us, but is it correct as a fact that the ADB, um, by which he means, I think, um, the linear route, uh, would always result in a system that would always pass the BR135 criteria? Um, I mean, that's my, my reading of what he's written there. Yeah. Similar to yourself, right. I think. It's your reading of it, I just, I, and I can understand that. But what I'm really asking you to stand back from the language of the of the document was it your own understanding uh, of of approved document B once Fire Note Nine came into it, and, and then in 2006 BS 8414 um, that uh, you might fail the linear route but could pass uh, BR 135. Well, I suppose that's. That's conceivable, and vice versa. And vice versa, indeed. indeed. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. But it, 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 on that basis, is, is it right that the linear route, as I call it, 12.6, diagram 40, and 12.7, was never expected to result in a system which would always pass BR135? I don't know whether that was, it was never expected, but I mean, you could never guarantee that, of course. Hmm because you, unless you tested everything and you, you know, that, that was following the, the, other, the other route. 
And how would the <coughs> expectation of the performance of the materials used under the linear route be consistent with the functional requirement of B4-1 to adequately resist the spread of fire over the walls? Well, that would be for others to make that judgment. Well, I'm asking, I'm asking the BRE, I'm asking you as the BRE. That's not something that, that, that we do. I mean, we, we are not there to provide the interpretation of the regulatory requirements on behalf of government. No, well, I, let me try this differently. Was it your understanding of the regulations, the regulatory framework, that even though you might pass the tests under the linear route, diagram 40, 12.6 and 12.7, as they became in, tw in 2006, um, you might, by doing that, still fail uh, to satisfy the functional requirement? Um, well, the functional requirement is the high-level requirement in the regulations, isn't it? So I'm not quite sure what, what you're asking there. I mean, the fact that the guidance provides those routes, then if you satisfy either of the routes, either of the options, then... My understanding is that that's the department's view that you have then satisfied the functional requirement. Right. And um, let's move on then in time, April 2014. Can we go to BRE 3047459? And if we go to the first email in the chain at the bottom of page two, you can see that this is an email from Brenda Apted of the CWCT to Sarah Colwell. Uh, on the 24th of April 2014 at 15.20. Now, I just should tell you this. You, you, you do get to see this email because you're looped into the email chain higher up, as we're going to see. Um, and she, Brenda Apted, says this. CWCT currently provides guidance on fire performance in Technical Note 73, fire performance of curtain walls and rain screens, copy attached. This explains the requirements of the building regulations and suggests how these requirements can be satisfied. Just pausing there, the inquiry has um, had some evidence about Technical Note 73, which was the CWCT's guidance, published in March 2011. Um, in April 2014, do you remember, were you familiar with that guidance? No, I, I don't believe I was. Right. Do you know whether anybody at the BRE, um, and I'm going to exclude you because of your last answer, but did anybody from the BRE have any input into any aspect of that guidance when it was crafted? I don't know. It, it, as, at the spring 24, as at spring 2014, uh, were you familiar with it? Not that I'm aware of, no. When you got this email string, did you read the attachment, which was Technical Note 73? I don't recall. Was it your practice to read attachments to emails that, um, into which you were looped? Sometimes, but not always. Um, right. I, you know, if it was addressed to um, another individual, then I would often um, leave it for them to deal with unless they actually brought it to me to, um, to discuss if there was a particular issue that they wanted to discuss. I mean, you, it just physically wasn't possible to read every attachment to every email that I was, I, I was ever sent. You know, the email right. traffic was quite vast. As, as a general question, given your, what you say about your familiarity with the document, w were you aware at all that there was no explanation in Technical Note 73 of the meaning or scope of the word filler? No, I wouldn't have been. Uh, or, or that there was no indication that the CWCT, for their part, understood that paragraphs 12.6 and 12.7 of approved document B in some way required the use of materials of limited combustibility in all elements of the external wall of high-rise buildings? No. Looking at her email, if we go <coughs> to the very bottom of page two, she says, we have had, a, we have had numerous inquirers, in, inquiries, I think that should say, in recent months regarding fire and facades. Issues that have been raised include and if you look at the first bullet point, use of combustible insulation in facades, particularly rain screens, this is causing problems due to the greater thickness of insulation that is required if limited combustibility materials have to be used. And then the fourth bullet point down, performance of composite panels such as ACMs. 
Were either of those subject matters of concern for the BRE at the time, so far as you were aware? Um, it depends what you mean. I mean, obviously, this, this email um, would have been considered by, by Sarah. So, you know, were they of issues of concern? Um, not in isolation, I suspect, but potentially in reading this, then that would have prompted some, some interest. Um, were, I, were either of these topics in these two bullet points matters on which the BRE had been receiving inquiries itself? Not that I'm aware of. Are you able to explain why the CWCT had been receiving inquiries, but, but BRE not? No, I can't, other than the sector of industry that they, they were representing, potentially, and their membership, I guess. Now, directly under the first list of bullet points, you can see, she says, we propose to hold a meeting to discuss the issues of fire and facades, to, and then she says, get a wider industry view, establish the adequacy stroke appropriateness of existing regulations, establish whether alternative solutions are available, establish what action CWCT should take. And then she goes on to say, depending on the outcome of the meeting, we would propose to establish a working group to oversee the development of CWCT work in this area. The working group would be drawn from those present at the initial meeting, but may include others with specialist knowledge, if appropriate. We would like to invite you to our initial <coughs> meeting, half a day meeting in central London. Do, do, do you remember this correspondence? No, I don't. If we move up the, pay, uh, up the chain to the middle of page two, we can see um, that uh, here is an email from Sarah Colwell on the 24th of April, same day, uh, a few minutes later, uh, to Stephen Howard, David Gall and Tony Baker. And she says... Uh, and you can see that you're copied in there, yes? yes? Okay. So yes. you're copied into this. Yes. And she says, this is something we need to be aware of and should consider being involved with because of the increasing number issues, similar to those identified below, which we are being asked by industry. It follows on from the discussion Tony and I had with Brian earlier in the year, which suggested that DCLG would be keen to see this type of document produced and then referenced in the FAQ area on the DCLG website. Now, okay. when you got that email in copy on the evening of the 24th of April 2014, uh, did you read it? I don't recall. Do you recall whether you read what had come from Brenda Aptid, which Sarah Colwell was copying you into? I don't recall. I mean, if I'd have read one bit, I'd have read the, the, mm. the rest of the chain, I'm sure. Right. But Do you know what the similar <coughs> issues which Sarah, issue, Sarah Colwell was referring to in this email, which uh, BRE was being asked by inquiry, no, by I don't. industry? No. Did you ask Sarah Colwell, well, what are those? No, I didn't. Why is that? Um, I mean, the, this email from Sarah, to which I'm CC'd in on, gives me comfort in that it's an area that Sarah was on top of and was dealing with, and that unless I was asked to become involved, it was not something that I needed to um, pursue further. Well, why do you think she copied it to you? I don't know. Well, um, w w was it her practice, to your knowledge, to copy you into emails which she wanted you to see? Um, sometimes. Sometimes it's just for information. Yeah. Um, it may have been because it was something that was unusual. I mean, certainly where we were asked to um, attend external meetings from time to time, um, you know, we had to go through a process then of deciding if we could actually self-fund those but attendances Dr. and Smith, so on. It's, it, it's a process yeah. question. Yes. When you received emails in copy, mm -hmm. was it your assumption that you should read what you'd been sent, or was, your, was it your practice not to bother? No, I didn't read everything that I was CC'd into. I was CC'd into very, very many email trails from many people across the business. And I say, it was by exception, really, if they then flagged that there was a particular issue that they needed to discuss with me, then they would send it to me rather than CC me in. Right. And 
you know, my approach was and always has been that uh, my door is open and I'm available to discuss things. So right. it was, you know... Do you, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to continue with this email chain for a little while, um, maybe for maybe 10 minutes or so. We need to do it in one go if we can. Yeah, yeah that would be better, wouldn't it? I think so. Yeah, yes, you carry on. Thank you. Um, now, uh, looking at Sarah Colwell's email into which you were copied, it refers to a discussion Tony and I had with Brian earlier in the year, that's 2014. Mm -hmm. At this stage, did you know anything about that meeting? Um, I don't recall. I say the, the context of this email, reading it sat here now, is that there are things that are going on, things seem to be um, under control. If there's a need for me to become involved, then they will involve me. Yeah. Were you aware that the DCLG would be keen to see this type of document produced? That's the FAQ. No. Did you have any idea what she meant when you were copied into this email, if, um, you'd, re if you'd read it? Yeah, I don't recall. D d did you understand at the time what an, a, a document referenced in the FAQ area on the DCLG website was, what kind of document that might be? No, I don't. Were you aware at all that Brian Martin or anybody else at the department had been keen or expressed keenness to the BRE earlier in the year for a document dealing with the types of matters listed in Brenda Aptid's email? Uh, no, no, I wasn't. So then you can't tell me who had suggested that such a document should be included on the FAQ section of the department's website? No. Right. Now, Sarah Colwell says in her statement, let's go to that, please, that's BRE 407571, page 83, paragraph 555, that she had, let's wait for it to come up, it's BRE 407571, page 83, Paragraph 555, and this is a, a one of a number of questions in relation to this email run. And she says, what action did you take at any stage in relation to raising the matter of an FAQ with Brian Martin? And she says, I recall that I discussed the matter with colleagues at BRE, Stephen Howard, Tony Baker, and Debbie Smith, and w C CWCT. Drafting options were discussed, which could be used either as an FAQ or alternatively as part of the upcoming approved document B consultation process. That's what she says. Um, do you recall having a discussion with her, as she says you did, about raising the idea of an FAQ on these subjects with Brian Martin? I don't recall that, no. You don't. Is this something you, you just never heard of, never heard about any of this? Well, I've heard about it now, no, obviously, but at, the time. but at the time, I mean, I don't recall from that time, no. I mean, I'm aware of it now, of course. Did you yourself ever discuss the idea of an FAQ on these subjects with Brian Martin or anyone else at the department? No, I don't believe I did. Do you know yourself whether Sarah Colwell ever raised the idea of an FAQ with Brian Martin or anyone else at the department? No, I don't. Let's go back to the exchange of emails, please, at BRE 3047459, page one, please. Uh, and at the very foot of the page, you can see Stephen Howard responds to Sarah Colwell, copy to you, David Gall, and Tony Baker. You see that? Yes, I can. We want to be involved. And if you turn the page, please, he says, can you let me know the date of the meeting when it is set? Thanks, Stephen Howard. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And then if we look at page one, if we go back to that, please, we can see that you respond to Stephen Howard and Sarah Colwell, copied to David Gall, Tony Baker, and Irene St. George. Uh, and you say, woo, this looks very dangerous. We need to discuss our strategy to ensure we don't end up handing the fire safety mantle to CWCT, a competitor, 
losing the need for BR135, BS8414, etc., etc., etc. I will get Irene to set up a meeting. Thanks, Debbie. Mm -hmm. What was your point? Um, I don't. I don't particularly recall this. Um, it's very unusual for me to respond in in a way like that. Um, <coughs> I mean, it, I think from what came next, the response then from Sarah obviously allayed my my concerns. Um, I mean, I guess I was probably just reading it out of context, and I, I really don't remember exactly what, what was going on um, in terms of my mind at the time. Um, I mean, obviously, the email that came from Steve Howard, um, there might very well have been, um, as part of the thoughts that were going on, um, would Steve Howard have been the right person to have participated in this as well because he he was only sort of recently becoming um, involved in this area of work and taking over the sort of leadership of it um, so just trying to put some I, was, I guess trying to put some context for his benefit around this um, so that a knee jerk reaction wasn't um, wasn't taken and that we had the opportunity to consider it um, at a meeting where everybody was represented and could express their their views to the background and explain um, who CWCT were etc what were your concerns you said that Sarah's response allayed your your concerns what what were those concerns um, so she's basically then going on to explain more of the background. The yeah, but what were your concerns? I'm sorry. What were your concerns, Dr. Smith? Um, well, it came out of the out of the blue, basically the the, the request. And um, as I said, that part of the issues were around how much we could fund and participate in activities of external bodies to BRE. Um, so part of that is part of the explanation, I guess, as to um, mentioning the fact that CWCT are a competitor. I mean, how much time do you devote um, in terms of our effort and resources in producing documents for others? Um, and whilst we, we do that, we have to do it in a very strategic way because BRE is subject to very many requests from many organisations to sit on their committees, etc., to help them draft, help them generate data, and so on and so forth. What and we were self-funding. I mean, we, we the, 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 there was no um, income, income stream to cover this type of activity. So what did you mean by this looks dangerous? Um, it was dangerous. Yeah, I'm... The but what was dangerous? I, I don't recall that particularly as to what my concern would have been around that. Um, well, let me, let me just get at this differently. You start this email with woo, exclamation mark. And you've told us that, that was an, a response that was uncharacteristic. And then you follow it up. Yes. This looks very dangerous. This was clearly a moment which called for a particularly strong reaction from you, say you felt. Yeah, so this Can you really was, not recall it? No, I can't, but I mean, it, it, it was a response back predominantly to Steve to say that we just need to consider this properly. Um, you know, don't, don't just go off and rush off and, and do something. Your concern appears to have been at the time that the CWCT was the BRE's competitor. They are a competitor to some yeah. degree, yes. In what way? Um, They're a trade organisation. How are they co well, no, a they, no, they also have um, testing capabilities and so on as well. So you were worried, my understanding. What, what did you mean by the fire safety mantle? Don't end up handing the fire safety mantle to CWCT, a competitor. What was that about? Um, Basically, the, you know, you have to understand the, the background to participating in these types of activities. 
Um, and in this case, yes, it's talking about CWCT. You can't, you can't just go in there um, unprepared well, it, to it's understand what, what the objectives are. You need to understand what they're doing and, and if we are indeed the right people to participate in this. Well, it, you know, it's, um, right. it, it was a badly written email and, but basically the message was, look, we need to sit down and talk about this. Um, talk about what? What I'm really seeking to understand from you is what your point was here. And your point appears to be uh, uh, discussing a strategy so that you don't lose a competitive commercial edge to CWCT. That's what this is about, isn't it? Well, potentially that, that comes through as part of the um, point. What, what's the rest of it? Um, well, it, say it's about understanding the context mm. and the cost to us as well in participating in these types of activities. Could you... Um, I mean, we had to, we had to make tough decisions um, consistently throughout the time from privatisation. You know, you cannot support every initiative and every activity that's going on out there. Yet, you know, we were requested to do so on <coughs> multiple occasions. Could you identify the words in this email which indicated that the BRE was interested in participating in a collaborative programme in, uh, in the interests of public safety? Um, not from that email, no. no. But then, as I say, as it goes on, Sarah has come back with a response, and um, I, it looks as though from then my response to that, that the need for the meeting and so on was dispelled, and um, that then participation um, took place, and Sarah contributed and, um, and participated. Would you agree that many, well, w when you responded, woo, this looks very dangerous, you had at least read what it was that had been sent to you in copy? Um, yes, partially, yes. yes. Well, when you say partially, which parts? Well, I certainly, this was a response to the Steve Howard email in particular. Um, and it was a, yeah, it's an off the cuff um, response that I suppose you could now say was probably an overreaction, actually, on my part. Well, it's not an overreaction, or it might be an overreaction in the way you expressed it. What I'm really seeking to understand is. When you read the email chain below this, did you not understand that many of the issues identified by Brenda Apted were important matters of public fire safety? Um, potentially, but I, I don't recall exactly what my what my views were at the time, um, and you know, and I hadn't had the opportunity at that point to discuss it. I mean, normally. Um, that's what we would do. We would sit down and discuss these things. Well, well, I, have, I have to say, um, Dr. Smith, just reading this mm. for what it says, one might get the impression that you were very concerned that CWCT was taking active steps to deal with a problem and were concerned that it might be asserting its position in the in the market, which you found unwelcome. Is that a fair reading? Um, I mean, that may well have been part of my immediate reaction to that. Well, it's the only Without, reaction we get yes, in this email. Yeah, from, but I say, I don't recall this um, specifically at the time. And, um, yeah, it, it looks like a knee-jerk reaction to something which is not the normal way that we operate and um, hence the, the, the comment there, look, we need to set up a meeting to discuss this. All right. But Thank as you. I say, it, it then evolved. So, yeah, I... All right. Thank you. No, Mr. Chair, one more question, then I'll... I'll well, all right, because I think we need to give the uh, yes, a chance to have a break. I mean, in light of the answer you've given the chairman and, to, and, and, and just before that, is it fair to say that... This email, this response, indicated that your sole concern was to protect the BRE's revenue streams uh, I and mean, you weren't interested uh, in matters of public fire safety. 
Um, well, that was never my sole motivation in anything. You could see how this email can be read that way. I can. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, is that a convenient? I think we should have a break at this point. Yes, thank you. We'll have a break now, um, okay. Dr. Smith. We'll um, resume at quarter to twelve, please. And okay. again, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quarter to twelve, please. Okay.
Would you ask Dr. Smith to come back in, please? All right, Dr. Smith? Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Phillips. <coughs> yes, Mr. De Chair. Um, can we move up the chain then, please? Or rather, go back to BRE 3047459 and go up the chain, please, to page one. And we can see Sarah Colwell's response to your email. Uh, and she says that this document has been around for several years and was focused on curtain wall issues. The problem is now the issues we are seeing in the industry that are not clearly defined in ADB, hence our meeting with DCLG earlier in the year and their suggested FAQ route. This CWCT revision would fit with that approach. We used to have good links to CWCT via BTG, but I'm not sure who's taking it on now. I'll follow up with Julie. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go on, th there's a reference in the first line there to this document. Yes? That, that, yes. That, that's a reference, isn't it, to CWCT's technical note 73 attached to the I envelope? I assume so, yes. Who is BTG? Um, that would be the building technology group within BRE. I see. I think. Right. And Julie, is that G Julie Brigula? Um Yes, I would imagine it is. And um, what were the issues that she says we are seeing in the industry and that are not clearly defined in ADB? I don't know the specific issues to which she's referring to. Did you ask her? We don't see that you did in the response. No, I don't, I don't recall asking her, but as I say, you know, Sarah seems to be fully in control of this. I would have no reason to um, sort of interfere with it unless she required me to do so in terms of the detail. Well, she's coming back to you, not in response to your woo email, but explaining the context of the substantive email from Brenda Apted of the 24th of April. Yes. At the bottom of the email chain. Were you not interested to know from her what the substantive issue was? I don't recall what... Um specifically at the time, but I say my reading of this is that it is somebody that is fully in control of um, what's going on and fully understands the background and um, is proposing a way forward. Well, that's true, as we can read it. But m my question is, is about, really, your curiosity. W were you not curious to know what the issues we are seeing in the industry that are not clearly defined in ADB were? not least given the role of the ADB in advising government on the amendments to ADB in 2005 and 2006? I don't recall at that time. Now, looking at your response at the top of the email chain, you say, Sarah, I suspect that no one has picked up the links and that's another good reason, sorry, another reason, why it could be a threat. We need to consider what we are going to do as we don't want everyone going to CWCT with their fire issues in the future. I recall we'll need to check that we had a draft IHS publication in, in this area. Depending on where it is, could that be re reviewed to address a number of these issues? Yeah. What issues? the issues, I presume, that, that are being referred to within the, um, the email lower down. What was the draft IHS publication? I don't recall. There may have been one that was around the um, cladding um, in general. Right. Um, so did the BRE actually have a draft document addressing these issues? I mean, I have a, obviously in this email, I had a recollection that there was something that was mm. in the pipeline or whatever, but I don't recall what happened as a consequence of this or indeed if it had been supported and, and drafted. 
Um, I mean, when you refer to these issues there, w which might be addressed by that publication of yours, presumably you were referring to the issues that had been spelt out by Brenda Apted in her email. Um, I can. That's all I can assume. Yes. Yes. And therefore, by the time you get to respond to Sarah Colwell on the 25th of April, you were fully aware of what the issues were, uh, fully aware of what Sarah Colwell was telling you, uh, uh, and fully aware, therefore, of the problems. Yes? Um, well, at a high level, potentially, yeah. I mean, I, I wasn't, um, I say, involved in any of the detailed discussions around these points. No, but um, you, you were, you were, uh, you were, you knew enough, level. you knew enough of the issues to be able to suggest the, uh, the checking at least of a draft IHS publication, which might have addressed the issues. Yeah, that, that was just a, a question, mm. wasn't it? It's a question. Is there, is there a draft, is there a draft IHS publication? Because I had some recollection that there would have been a discussion about that, that could potentially review and be changed to address some of the issues. That would, could that be reviewed to address a number of the issues? Your main concern in this is about the threats posed by CWCT as a competitor, isn't it? Um, that's part of it, yes. It, it certainly appears to be so, yes. But it's the, it's the subject of the first two sentences, isn't it? Um, no one's picked up the links. I mean, I think that's referring to um, probably the BTG reference in Sarah's email below, um, which obviously was owned by BTG. Um, and that why would that be a threat? Well, potentially because we just hadn't been following any of the work and paying any uh, attention to it, if that link had been broken. So that I think that's what that first sentence is referring to. Um, well, yeah, and then the next bit is, um, you know, we need to make sure um, that we're not, I guess, marginalised in terms of uh, this ongoing area of work. Yes. Um, let's go to BRE 30s 35257. This is the code of conduct we looked at yesterday, I think, from September 2014, code of conduct and ethics policy. You recall that? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, if you go, please, to uh, page uh, two, paragraph one, uh, uh, there is a heading, Our Ethical Principles. Yes? Yes. And you can see what those those are. Yes. And if, if you go uh, to honesty and integrity, one of those was about the duty to uh, ensure uh, that we acquire and use wisely and faithfully the knowledge that is relevant to the skills we need in the service of others. Yes. Mm. And if you go to page three in the final section, under the heading <coughs> Respect for Life, Law and the Public Good. It says, we give due weight to all relevant law, facts and published guidance, BRE group requirements and the wider public interest. And will, you see that, will yes, yes. Uh, ensure that all our work is lawful and justified and then in the penultimate bullet point, hold paramount the, the health and safety of others. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yes, I do. And under expertise, science and research, it says, as we saw yesterday, remember that we hold a privileged and trusted position in society and thus expect to demonstrate that we are seeking to serve wider society and be sensitive to public concerns. Now, apart from the fact that this code was dated September 2014 and the exchanges we've been looking at just now uh, took place in the April of that year, can you explain how 
your responses in those emails, particularly the woo, this looks dangerous email, are consistent with the principles that I've just read to you? So, I mean, BRE, the staff, myself, everybody has always um, done work to, for the public good and to support the health and safety of others in the environment. That, that is part of the raison d'etre. The stark reality is, around all of that, you still have to earn money, otherwise you're not there. You cease to exist. And um, you cannot therefore provide support to every piece of work that is going on outside that is health and safety related and for the public good. BRE just does not have the depth of staff and resources and um, the, the income to enable that to happen. Um, and strategic decisions have to be taken about prioritising and supporting those activities. Um, you know, every, every year we used to go through a cycle, for example, in um, looking at standards committee attendance because all of the standards that are produced fall within this category of being for the public good and for the health and safety of others. Um, but we just can't physically send somebody to every single standards committee that is working within that space. So you have to sit down and take decisions about which activities you can afford to support. And, um, and, and that's really the environment within which we've had to exist um, since privatisation. There is nobody there that is funding those um, attendances. And, you know, as I said, the, the reality is if you don't earn any income from other sources, which nevertheless are there to underpin the health and safety requirements, etc. So pretty much all of the testing and certification activities that we undertake, say, in the fire safety area, are aimed at and do support the implementation of the building regulations and um, the approved documents. Um, and, you know, it's very necessary that you earn that income to enable you to continue to, to operate within that space. Do you accept, Dr Smith, that quite contrary to the service of wider society, your reaction to seeing Brenda Apted's email, which suggested collaborative work, was to plan a strategy to work out how to guard and protect the BRE's fire safety mantle for what was in reality reasons of self-interested private commercial competition. Not entirely, no I don't. I understand the way that that email was read but I think you can also see the way that the um, conversation then went on and you also then have to look at the fact that we did support that once all of the facts and so on became and were made um, available to me and I became aware of the context to that. <coughs> so you will see that we did support the activities at our cost and we did um, send um, people to to the meetings to, to do that. So I think to just take that one email um, in, in isolation is not a true and fair reflection of the decisions that were taken. Right. Well, let's see how this then moves mm. on in time. Can we then move to June 2014 and go to CLG 3031777? Uh, this is a, 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 an email uh, sent from Charlotte Robin to uh, herself. She's at Arup, but also to Brian Martin uh, and Barbara Lane mm -hmm. uh, for a meeting on the 25th of June. It's an invitation. Yes. Uh, and it says in the text, all as discussed, this meeting is intended to discuss some particular issues we, we come across related to the interpretation of performance requirements and how this is being achieved in real building applications. This covers multiple aspects of the fire stroke facade interface 
including the use of combustible materials and fire stopping. And then you can see the attendees include you, Brian Martin, Barbara Lane, Charlotte, Charlotte Robin, and Neil Butterworth. Yes? Yes, I can see that. Um, do you remember going to that meeting? Um, I remember going to a meeting with Arup, but I don't remember Brian Martin being there. And I do recall, I think Sarah Colwell was there. Do you know who initiated that meeting? I mean, clearly, mechanically, it had been Arup, but do you know who initiated it? No, I don't. Do you know what the previous discussions were to which Charlotte Robin refers in the first line of this email? No, I, I don't think I'd had any discussions with Charlotte at all right. prior to this. Do you know what the particular issues were that were going to be discussed? Um, I don't recall. Do they align with any of the matters set out in Brenda Aptid's email of the 24th of April 2014? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, one of the things I do recall was a discussion around the definitions at the meeting of non-combustibility and limited combustibility. I do remember that. Do you remember any discussions about um, the different aspects of the fire or facade interface, including the use of combustible materials and fire stopping? Um, which was the intended topic. I don't recall those specifics, no. Right. Do you remember what specifically was discussed about the use of combustible materials at the meeting? My recollection is that Arabs had got a particular project in mind at the time and were interested in how the provisions would apply to that right. and we're asking for some clarifications from our understanding. Uh, why did you think that the BRE would be able to assist Arup in understanding the provisions as I, you call them? I don't think um, I don't think I would have had a view of that at the time is it not because I, I regarded BRE as being able to offer an insight into the intended meaning and effect of the guidance on combustible materials in facades, given I, its role in assisting government in making the amendments to ADB in 2006? I don't know. I don't know what would have been Arab's motivation in that respect. I mean, obviously where the facades were concerned, um, there would have been some expectation that they wanted to discuss also in line with um, matters associated with BR135, potentially classification, etc., mm. which would be why um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Sarah Colwell attended that meeting with me. Well, she's not on the list, but you think she was there, do you? I think she did attend this meeting. Right. But you think Brian Martin didn't? No, I don't think he did. And actually, I don't think Neil Butterworth did either. But I, I say I, I, can't, I can't be 100% certain about that. When you were going to the meeting, what did you think the purpose of your, your attendance was? Why did they think um, they wanted you there? I think I was seen as the, the point of contact within BRE, somebody that they knew. Right. And um, was, do you remember any discussion about the meaning or interpretation or scope of paragraphs 12.6 and 12.7 of approved document B? I don't recall. I mean, I'm sure it probably was touched upon um, within the context of facades and um, BR 135. Right. What about the appropriateness or otherwise of class naught as a classification for fire performance? <laughs> for the external surfaces of buildings above 18 metres? I mean, I don't recall it in <coughs> specific detail, no. What, do you know what the outcome of the meeting was? Can you recall what that was? No, I can't. I mean, obviously, it was a, a request from Arup. Um, there was a discussion, and I don't think we ever had any follow-up from them in, in regard to the uh, discussions that we had. Was there any discussion about the use of K15 on high-rise buildings? No, I don't believe so. 
Was there any discussion about the use of other combustible insulation materials on buildings above 18 metres? Um, it would probably only have been in a very generic sense. I can't imagine we would have talked specifically about any particular manufacturer or their product. Right. Um, were there any action points you recall? No. Agreed? Not that I can recall at all. This meeting took place uh, exactly a week before the CWCT fire group meeting at Arab on the 2nd of July 2014, which is, is in fact the meeting that had been proposed in Brenda Apted's 24th of April 2014 email. Okay. Uh, can we take it that um, you were aware of the CWCT fire group meeting on the 2nd of July at the time it happened or before it happened? Um, I, I, I assume I was because of the email trail that, and, and that we actually agreed that, yes, we were mm. going to attend that. Yeah. I, I know you didn't attend it, but Sarah Colwell no. did, didn't she? Yes, correct. Did you have a discussion about the BRE's um, strategy, your word from the email run, mm -hmm. with Sarah Colwell in advance of the meeting? No, I mean, the strategy that I was referring to would not, it was not on in terms of what to say and what to do at the meeting because the scope and the, um, the extent of the discussions would not have been known in advance. It, the strategy is more about whether you attend or you don't right. attend, whether we can participate actively or we can't. Did you have any discussion with Sarah Colwell at all about the meeting? I don't recall. Before what about after the meeting? Do you remember having a discussion with or debrief from Sarah Colwell about I, the meeting? I don't recall that at all, no. You don't recall? Now, g given the immediate reaction from you we saw in the email run in April and your um, scepticism, if that's the right word, about the, the meeting at all, can you explain why you didn't seek to find out what had happened at the meeting from Sarah Colwell? Well, I can't recall um, the details from the time, but um, the very fact that we'd got to the point where we were going to participate and support the participation in, in that um, activity, um, that's kind of the decision point, and you then expect others to, as I say, um, get on and do the work and do whatever they need to do. and. I would not have expected to necessarily have immediate report backs on, on everything that was going on unless there was a particular issue that um, Sarah had wanted to discuss with me. But we, given the potential threat to the fire safety mantle that the collaboration with CWCT presented, as you saw it at the time, do you not recall uh, insisting or asking Sarah Colwell to, just to tell you what happened? No, I mean, because we'd gone beyond that and the, the issues that I appeared to have been concerned about must have been satisfactorily resolved, otherwise we wouldn't have been participating. Let's go to the minutes at CLG 3019336. Now we can see that it's a minute of a meeting held at Arab on the 2nd of July 2014 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon present David Metcalf in the chair from CWCT and you can see who else was there. Uh, Sarah Colwell is named third down uh, and, and there are other people there including Brian Martin who was there it is said for some of the meeting but not all of it. Ivan Meredith from Kingspan uh, and other names. Uh, just looking at the, at the minute on its first page, is this a document that you saw at the time do you think? I don't recall. Do you remember whether you have seen them before just now? I have seen it before since now um, in the preparation for, right. um, for the public inquiry, basically. But not at the time, is that right? I don't recall seeing it at the time. If we go to page three first, please, you can see that there's a, a section at the top of your screens which says combustibility of insulation. Uh, and I'll read it to you. Limited combustibility insulation should be used above 18 metres when following the prescriptive requirements of ADB, clause 12.7, but other materials, principally foil-faced phenolic foam, are often used in rain screen walls. There is a degree of ignorance 
with some people confusing class naught with limited combustibility. In other cases, building control officers are permitting the use of class naught materials, making it difficult for cladding consultants to enforce the requirement for limited combustibility ins insulation. Higher standards of thermal insulation are required, uh, are requiring greater thicknesses of insulation, and in some cases this can only be achieved within the designated wall zone by use of combustible insulation. Architects are unaware of the problem and need to allow a wider wall zone to accommodate the greater thickness required with limited combustibility material. Now, um, first, within the industry, did you know that there was, as is said here, a degree of ignorance with some people confusing class naught with limited combustibility? Um, no, I didn't. You weren't. Were you aware at the time, July 2014, that building control officers were permitting the use of class naught products composed of combustible materials in high-rise buildings? No, I would not you have weren't. known that. Right. Uh, w would it have come as a surprise to you to discover either of or both of those facts? Um, yes. Mm. But you say Sarah Colwell didn't pass that back to you? Not that I'm aware of, no. Right. Um, still on page three, under the heading Use of ACM on High Rise Buildings, ACM refers to aluminium composite material. The normal material consists of two skins of aluminium approximately half a millimetre thick, separated by a polyethylene core two to five millimetres thick. This material generally achieves a reaction to fire classification of class naught or class B S one D naught. There are versions available with a mineral core which can achieve A two S one D naught. There are also similar materials available with other metals such as copper used for the facing. There have been major fires in buildings in various parts of the world, including the Middle East and France, where ACM materials have been used for the cladding with the ACM responsible for external fire spread. Now, um, was any of that imparted to you by Sarah Colwell after the meeting? Um, well, I think, I, as I've already said in earlier evidence, we were aware of the major fires that were occurring in the Middle East and we had had discussions um, internally with several um, different people um, as to whether that could actually happen in the UK or not. And that's really where we would, we, we, we had reviewed the guidance as written. And I mean, as I say, I, I was absolutely convinced by what I'd heard that that could not happen in the UK if well, the guidance was being interpreted and used correctly. So, um, but at the times that those things happened and, and so on, you know, I, I don't know. Hmm. You say in that last answer that you had reviewed the guidance and you were absolutely convinced by what I'd heard that that could not happen in the UK. Now, yes. When did you review the guidance in light of the Middle East fire, the UAE fires? Well, it would have been around the time that those occurred, and I say I can't, I can't be specific about dates because I don't recall those. But um, you know, I had discussions with um, with Sarah and people such as Martin Ship and so on in terms of um, what we were seeing, and based on our very, very limited um, knowledge of what was going on in the construction sector mm. at the time. I mean, I'll give you the dates, see if they're familiar. Um, the Al Baker Tower, 18th of January 2012. The Altea Tower, 28th of April 2012. Saif Belhaza, 6th of, of October 2012. Tamwil, 8th of November 2012. And Al Hafit in April 2013. Yeah, so I... Those, uh, were those fires you knew about? Um, I, I can't I don't know, the, don't recognise the names of them all like that. but Around the, but, the time frame? Yes, yeah, of course. I mean, and it's likely that the discussion would have initially taken place around one of the first ones that were high profile and well reported, and that we would have then had the discussion around that time. And then obviously subsequent ones, mm -hmm. we would not keep repeating that discussion because the view was that everything was, um, as we understood it, okay in the UK. Um, 
In your answer before last, you referred to a very, very limited of knowledge of what was going on in the construction sector at the time. Why was the BRE's knowledge in 2014 of what was going on in the construction sector very, very limited? Um, I mean, our role was not one of either design of buildings or inspection and signing off of buildings. So we were removed from that. You know, the role was one of just testing and um, classifying products, materials that came to us, or if um, a particular issue um, was raised and discussed or researched by us. But, and, well, and the other area that we would have some very limited information would be that collected in the fire investigation type um, activity. But apart from that, we, you know, we were not on site. We had nobody on site um, on a regular basis at all. Presumably you knew, as she told us, that Dr. Colwell was travelling to the UAE, or the Middle East, I think, as she put it, um, two or three times a year. Um, Is that not right? Well, well, I mean, Sarah did go to the Middle East. I was aware she went to the Middle East. Mm. I don't know whether it was two to three times a year. Well, that's what that she sounds, told us. Okay, well, I, I, if, that's, um, if that's what she said, then that must be the case. Um, she was asked to support them in terms of their development of their fire code and their uh, in, um, addressing the issues that they were faced with external cladding fires, so the examples that you gave earlier. So they wanted to, as I understand it, revise their fire code and then hmm. see what standards were available and so on that could potentially help them. Now, going back to the answer you gave a few minutes ago, you said that in light <coughs> of the fires in the, in the Middle East, you had discussions internally with several different people as to whether that could ha actually happen in the UK or not. First, who were those several different people? I think I said it was um, Sarah, yes. um, Martin Ship, um, potentially David Crowder, and I think it would have probably involved Tony Baker as well. And you go People on to say... Been, sorry. Um, you, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry, sorry Karen, you. No, that's OK. OK. Um, you go on to say that you had reviewed the guidance as written and you were absolutely convinced by what you'd heard that that could not happen in the UK. W was it your position, and you go on to qualify it, if the guidance was being interpreted and used correctly, that's your qualifier, was it your position and understanding at the time that the UK construction industry was interpreting and using the guidance in the way you understood it, as you've explained to us? Yes, that was my view. What was that view based on? The fact that we were not aware of any problems. Right. So let's then go back to the note of the meeting, use, use of ACM on high-rise buildings, and you see that it says in the second sentence, the normal material consists of two skins of aluminium, etc., separated by a polyethylene core, two to five millimetres. This meeting is being told that ACM on high-rise buildings contains those ingredients, components, as the normal material. Did that fact not get reported to you? Did you not know that? No, I don't recall being aware of that at all. Is there any reason why Sarah Colwell, given the discussions that you'd had with her, having reviewed the guidance and thinking that nobody um, would be uh, putting that material on high-rise buildings if they were complying with the guidance, uh, tell you that, in fact, at the meeting it transpired that ACM products with a polyethylene or otherwise combustible core were being used in the UK above 18 metres. Sorry, so was there any reason why she wouldn't tell me? Yes. Is that what you're asking? That is what I'm I, asking. I don't know. Well, you'd be, can you think of a reason why she would not have reported back to you the fact that, contrary to your collective beliefs before this meeting, that ACM of the polyethylene core wasn't being used 
because it wouldn't have complied. In fact, it was being used. Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. I'm suggesting to you there isn't a reason why she wouldn't have reported that back to you. I don't rec recall having that discussion and that being reported back to me. So is it your evidence to the inquiry that, as of July 2014, you were unaware that ACM products with a polyethylene or otherwise combustible core were being used in the external wall arrangements of buildings with a habitable story over 18 metres in England and Wales? Yes. Now, I think it's right that because you told us earlier in your evidence that that kind of product should never, ever be used above 18 metres. You'll recall that evidence. That's my personal opinion, yes. And was it your personal opinion in July 2014? Um, I suppose my opinion, as I express it now, is based upon the information, well, and the, the tests that I witnessed in... August 2017. No, but was it your personal opinion in so, July 2014, Dr Smith? Uh, yeah, I, I don't recall precisely if I, um, what my opinion was within that context that you're asking there. Well, you told us in... But in terms, I suppose, of compliance um, and um, satisfying the requirements as I understood them in the approved document, then yes, they should not be, that should not have been in use. And indeed, I think it's right, isn't it, that in July 2014 you would have been, well, you were, uh, well aware of the dangers of the use of ACM products with a polyethylene core because of the tests carried out on exactly that type of rain screen cladding product during the 2001 CC1924 programme. Um, which led to, yes, the production of BR135, and the means, or a means, by which to basically prevent those products being used, yes. Oh, well, that's, that's um, can I just explore that? Was it your understanding that CC 1924 led to prevention of those products being used? Um, it led to the production of BR 135. No, but it didn't no. lead, did it, to the word filler being inserted in 2006? Which, what didn't? Um, let, me, let me ask it to, to you in an open way. You said uh, that... Uh, maybe I've misunderstood your evidence, but was it your understanding that the CC1924 programme led to the introduction of the word filler and its effect? Uh, no. No. Did you consider, what, were you aware of any further testing since 2001 that produced any better results for ACM with a PE core panel, either um, under the uh, linear route or under what became BS8414 parts one or two? No, not that I'm aware of, no. Did you consider in 2014, or, or indeed at any other time, up to the time of the Grenfell Tower fire, that the use of composite metal panels with a polyethylene core in the facade of a residential high-rise building would present anything other than a grave risk to the lives of occupants of that building? I... Sorry, I'm not... I can't answer yes or no to that because I'm not quite sure of the line that you, 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 you followed there, but basically I could not see how ACM could be used on a high-rise building in the UK Without because of the guidance, yeah. yeah. And couldn't be, do you accept this extra bit, couldn't be used on high-rise buildings in the UK, where, at least where they were residential, without the gravest of risks to the lives of the occupants? Yes. Yes. Now, do you remember whether, as a result of the meeting, you were aware that any action needed to be taken 
did anybody tell you, did Sarah Norwell <coughs> tell you that as a result of this meeting... Well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Lee, but if we're, if we're going to move from the meeting... Can uh, I just ask... We're not, but we're not, but, we, but I don't well, know, um, interrupt. We've been told that in the course of the meeting, views were expressed about the uh, effect of 12.7 in its then and current form. Oh, we're coming to that. Are you coming to yes. that? Yes. Then I'll let you do it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, th th that's okay. I, if we can go back to the minutes, let's do that now. Um, let's go to the minutes at page four, please. Paragraph two down, second paragraph on the page. And uh, there you can <coughs> see it says, we want, yes, we want page four, please. I'm so sorry, page four, second paragraph down. Um, after the reference to the uh, academic literature, in the italics at the top, you can see this, it says this. It was stated that Clause 12.7 12, clause 12 of ADB is intended to prohibit the use of polyethylene, called ACM, in buildings over 18 metres, as they are not classed as limited combustibility. This is not clear from the wording of the current clause. The current clause is preceded by a heading, insulation materials stroke products, which implies that it only applies to insulation. The wording of the main text refers to filler materials, which could be taken to include the polyethylene core, but this is not clear. Now, do you know, from what you knew, heard, saw at the time, who it was who had said at the meeting, stated at the meeting, that 12.7 was intended to prohibit the use of ACM polyethylene products in buildings over 18 metres? No, I don't know who said that. It, it, presumably, this statement aligned with your own view at the time of ADB. Is that right? Just looking at it on the page. Um, yes, that it couldn't, that it was intended to prohibit the use, yes. Okay. Had you previously been aware before this meeting that there were others in the industry to whom this was apparently not clear, using the last two words of that paragraph? Um, no, no, I was not. Had it never come up in any of the inquiries received by the BRE before July 2014? Not that I was involved in, no. But it is correct, isn't it, from the emails we saw in November 2013, that that lack of clarity had been raised by the BRE, Tony Baker particularly, with government. We saw that. Yes. But you yes, were we not did. aware of that at all? No. Didn't cross your desk? Not that I'm aware of, no. In the third paragraph, you can see this. It was suggested that clarification could be achieved by means of an FAQ. Approved documents can be downloaded from the government planning portal. The page for each approved document also has an FAQ section related to that approved document. Sarah Colwell agreed to raise this with Brian Martin. So were you told as a result of this meeting that there was not going to be a CWCT document? Um, not that I can recall, no. Was it, were you told that it was Sarah Colwell who had, I don't, I don't know if volunteered if is the right word, but would be raising that matter with Brian Martin? Um, not, not that I can recall. Were you told by Sarah Colwell that as a result of her volunteering to do that, the fire safety mantle rested secure with the BRE? Not that I can recall. Um, I thought Brian Martin was at the meeting. He was at the meeting for some of it, so he says, and we can be investigating okay. that later. Okay. But since you weren't there, I'm not sure yes. that yeah. helps terribly much. Um, had, it, had that been the strategy, uh, to go into the meeting uh, with Sarah Colwell essentially taking charge of this topic, uh, to retain control by um, uh, raising with Brian Martin the FAQ? No. 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 I'm not, I'm not sure that um, the suggestion of an FAQ, where that would have come from, um, that's not an area that I think BRE has any particular familiarity with. Well, we saw the reference to an FAQ in the Tony Baker email chain back in November 2013, it, so I wonder whether that's quite right, Dr Smith. Yeah, but I, I, FAQs are not um, a vehicle that we have... I think ever had any sort of involvement with. So the FAQs on the planning portal 
Um, to my knowledge, anyway, we've we've never been involved in drafting any FAQs or, or anything like that. Well, can you explain to us then, in the light of that, why Sarah Colwell agreed to raise the possibility of an FAQ with Brian Martin if it was so alien to the BRE? Well, I'm guessing that she, um, somebody else would have probably suggested that as a means, and then um, Sarah acted or agreed to act as a. Um, a conduit for that discussion. Why would she do that if she was so unfamiliar with that as a process? I can't answer that. I don't know. But uh, all I can say is I'm not aware that BRE ha has ever had any involvement prior to this in drafting or whatever, any, any FAQs. Can we take it that you are aware, sitting there today, that no FAQ document on any aspect of the meaning or scope of paragraphs 12.6 and 12.7 of the approved document was published at any time before the Grenfell Tower fire. I now understand that, yes. Yes. Do, do you know whether one was ever even drafted? I'm not aware of that, no. You're not a, in other words, you have never seen no, or I heard haven't. of one being drafted? No. Right. Were you aware that, uh, of Sarah Colwell or, or anybody else at the BRE ever working even on a draft, however sketchy? Not that I'm aware of, no. I mean, obviously, Sarah would be able to answer that more specifically. Uh, well, we've had her evidence, Dr okay. Smith. We have also heard evidence that a meeting took place on the 8th of September 2014 between Sarah Colwell, Alan Keeler of the CWCT and others to discuss the potential FAQ and how the wording was to be formulated. Did you, did you attend that meeting? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Did you discuss of. that meeting with Sarah Colwell either before or after the 8th of September 2014? Not that I'm aware of, no. Were you aware that by March 2015, David Metcalf of the CWCT was chasing Sarah Colwell by email <coughs> to find out what was happening with the note that she had apparently agreed to draft? No. Were you aware that Sarah Colwell responded to that chaser, telling him that the document had been drafted and would be circulated? No. no. I take it that you've never seen such a document? No, I haven't. Uh, let's go to her statement. Please, BRE 304751, page 84, paragraph 565. She says uh, this... Five six five. Uh, and the question is, if an FAQ on this matter was drafted, when and by whom was that done? You see that? Yes. And five six five, which has now disappeared. Please, can we scroll down to the bottom of page eighty four? Um, in the end, sorry, uh, the 565, thank you. Um, several outlines of the FAQ were discussed between BRE staff and CWCT representatives, but nothing was finalised. That's what she says. Were you involved in discussions um, about the, uh, the outlines of the FAQ? Not that I can recollect, no. Do you know whether a positive decision was ever made not to finalise it? No. I don't. Do you understand why no FAQ was finalised? Um, no, I don't. Do you know when it was decided that an FAQ, notwithstanding the promise made to the meeting by Sarah Colwell, was not finalised? No, I don't. Now, uh, in her oral evidence to the inquiry on day 233, Sarah Colwell told us that the decision that an FAQ would not be the appropriate route by which to deal with this matter, and that no such document would be produced by the BRE, was a decision taken in or by August or September 2014. Does that sound right to you? That was her evidence. Um, I can't, I, I don't know. You don't know? Um, let me show you what she says elsewhere in that, in her evidence. Can we go please to her transcript of day 234 and go to page 12? Uh, 
day two, three, four. And at line five, she says this. As I said yesterday, we were becoming aware, and this is September 2014, that it was more than a single point response that the document needed. And looking at where the changes were going to be required, it was going to be a larger piece of work around that. The decision was taken around that time of August, September, to look at whether it was better to move to a full review of part 12 and part of the outcome of the meeting from this was, it was clear that there was more required than just a simple FAQ question with a written answer. It was a more detailed response that was needed. D do you remember discussions about that? Um, no, I don't. And, I mean, in, in terms of a review of, a full review of part 12, I assume that's referring to the... Um, clauses in the approved document. Um, I mean, the, that that must have been based on a discussion with Brian Martin because BRE was not in a position to um, implement or undertake any review of Part Twelve. Can we go to um, page twenty-eight of this transcript, please? Uh, and in fact, I, I think we probably should pick it up at the foot of page 27 to give you a little bit of the, the context. And uh, at line 21, Miss Grange has put to Sarah Colwell this. Just to be clear, who made the final decision within the BRE that no FAQ route was to be pursued? Was that Dr. Smith? Answer, I believe that came as a conversation between Dr. Smith and myself, yes. And if we turn the page, line one, right, but she is the senior, yes. Answer, yes. Question at line three, did she take that final decision that the FAQ route was not one you were going to go down? Answer at line five, it was agreed between us, so yes, in that sense, yes. I'm putting that to you as her evidence. Do you accept it? I don't recall that at all. And I would... So I, I can't, I can't um, say yes or no. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed that that's her recollection of that. Um, as I say, any revision of Clause 12, as suggested on the previous... I think previous page, um, would not be one for us to undertake anyway. And it, similarly, um, BRE would not be in the position to issue an FAQ in relation to the planning portal. And why did Sarah so, Colwell agree to help with it then? So I'm, I'm puzzled by, by this. I mean, it's when not BRE's role to um, to write the guidance directly, nor to interpret the guidance. Is that something you told Sarah Colwell at the time? It's something that was, I believe, well understood. How was it well through, understood? Based on um, discussions that would have taken place over over many years. I mean, people knew that... And, and that's evidenced by the fact of the um, email that you, circ you showed earlier where Tony Baker had written to Brian Martin seeking, you know, um, an interpretation mm -hmm. of um, the, the, the text in, um, part, in part 12 of um, approved document B. Looking at what Sarah Colwell volunteered to do, it wasn't to issue the FAQ, it was, to, it was to assist with the drafting of an FAQ for Brian Martin so that he could put it up on the government's portal. Yes, so it's not our decision as to whether that route would be um, followed or not. 
it would have to be Brian Martin's or the department's decision as to whether that was the appropriate route to take. Coming back to her evidence, I think you is it your evidence that you can't quarrel one way or the other with her recollection? I can't recall this, no. No, but do you quarrel with her recollection? Do you say that her recollection is faulty, or do you say that she might recall that, but you can't? Correct. Is it the latter of those yes. two? Thank you. If we go then to the witness statement of David Metcalf, that's at CWCT 40... <coughs> 40115, forgive me, CWCT 40115. I want to show you what he says at page 13, at paragraph 47. And this is under 2015 communications, meetings and communications. At the paragraph 47, he says this. In the event a draft of the FAQ was not shared with CWCT, I do not know why a draft was not shared. The last contact I had with Sarah Colwell about this suggested that the draft was nearing completion and would be sent to us soon for comment. I chased Sarah Colwell for the draft via email and I left at least one voicemail. I also asked a colleague of Sarah Colwell's at the time to chase her for me, but I still did not receive any further contact. Do you know why a draft document wasn't shared with CWCT as promised to him by Sarah Colwell? No, I don't. Now, we don't need to go through the correspondence, but if we go over the page to page 14 of his statement, David Metcalf says, I'm in, I am aware the inquiry has an email chain which shows some of the attempts made to chase BRE for progress on the FAQ. Additionally, I exhibit further emails which give further examples, and then he sets out five emails between the 13th of March 2015 and the 10th of November 2015. Uh, and there are also voicemails that he had left her, uh, to which she, Sarah Colwell, did not respond, as you can see from paragraph 49 of his statement. Do you know why uh, those five emails and voicemails were ignored by Sarah Colwell? No, I don't. Do you know why the CWCT was not updated about the decision contrary to the 2nd of July minute, not to finalise an FAQ uh, and not to submit anything to Brian Martin? No, I don't. Do you accept that the CWCT ought to have been updated on those matters so as to allow them for themselves to decide what they might want to do, such as put out a, a document? Yes, I do. Was anything... Uh, uh, was this to do with the CWCT's involvement being perceived by you as dangerous? No, no, it was not. Can we look at Sarah Colwell's statement, please? BRE 407571, page 84. And she says at paragraph 564, towards the foot of the page, in the end, no final FAQ was prepared as, an, as ongoing discussions in this period referred us to the upcoming review of approved document B. Please see my answer to question 134 above. And then she goes on to say, at 566, at the foot of the page, was it ever submitted to Brian Martin is the question, no is the answer. What do you know about those discussions, ongoing discussions in this period, referring to the upcoming review of approved document B? What do you know about those? Um, my knowledge was the same as um, most people, I guess, in the fire sector at the time. We were regularly updated at various meetings with industry, etc., as to the planned program for a review of the approved document. And in fact, the research project that was tendered and that we won in 2012 was um, one of the um, pieces of information, if you like, that was used in support of the um, department's um, information exchange with industry that it was intended that the outputs from the 2012 research project which ran till 2015 would then be part of the consultation package that would go into the review document for the approved document so that 
that's basically the the ongoing information exchange and, and discussions that, that were going on. It was all around a commitment as we understood it and as the fire sector in general understood it on behalf of the department that there was um, an up and coming review of ADB imminent. And I think, you know, at that time it was being spoken about as potentially happening in around 2016. And which is why the um, three year research program was started when it was with a view to providing new technical evidence, et cetera, to support um, consultation on, on changes going forward. Now, Dr. Colwell's evidence was that it was you who was having these ongoing discussions um, about the upcoming review of approved document B with the department. Well, that's, what she, I, that's what she said at day 233. Okay, so, I mean, it's as I've just conveyed it to you. I mean, wasn't having direct conversations with them about any specifics in relation to that. It's the fact that they had let the contract, which we understood and had always been explained, not just to us, but to the fire sector in general and all the key stakeholders, that that was the precursor to the forthcoming review of ADB that was being planned by the department. So that, that was the nature of that. So there were no other real discussions other than we were aware of that. We knew what the um, intended output from those projects were. And, um, and that was understood and widely known in the fire sector. And it would routinely be discussed at fire sector group meetings and, and so on and so forth. In what way would any ongoing discussions about the upcoming review of approved document B preclude the publication uh, of an FAQ in the meantime, giving clarity to the problem about ADB, which had been discussed at the 2nd of July CWCT meeting? I don't know that it would have done. I don't, I don't recall. Um, I don't recall that specific right. matter being a point of discussion. W was it as a result of those ongoing discussions that no FAQ document was drafted? Not that I recall, no. Well, well what was the reason? I don't know why the FAQ was not published. So is it your evidence that you ha had no discussion at all? <coughs> so far as you can recall, with Sarah Colwell about the potential FAQ in response to the problem? I don't recall um, a, any discussion around that matter, no. Um, I mean, I do know and um, I'm fully aware, as I say, that about the up-and-coming review of the approved document and the, the discussions around that and what was very well known and public information at the time. And who in the department were you having discussions about the upcoming review of ADB with? Um, insofar as it related to the research projects that were being undertaken, um, I think at the time it was Brian Martin. Right. And during those discussions, did the subject of an FAQ on 12.7 come up? Um, not within the context of the research project that we were undertaking, no. In, in what context? Um, well, I, I don't recall having had that discussion with him at all, but I, I, the I point see. I'm trying to make is that the discussions were bounded really by the research project that was being undertaken, so. Um, can I show you Brian Martin's witness statement uh, at uh, page 49? This is at CLG 3019469, page 49, paragraph 138. Uh, and uh, here he says uh, this, on 17th March 2016, I attended the second meeting of the CWCT technical group. At the meeting, a draft roadmap to summarise the measures needed to ensure a facade complies with the prescriptive rules of ADB was presented. I recall being satisfied that the roadmap adequately set out 
how compliance with the functional requirements could be achieved, the minutes go on to note that 2015 BCA guidance note 18 had extended the limited combustibility requirement to all material in the wall of a tall building. This was not an objectionable clarification. Indeed, at the meeting, it was accepted, as is recorded, that paragraph 12.7 of ADB was open to interpretation. Acting on behalf of the department, I undertook to change this misleading clause in the next revision of ADB. The conclusions of that section of the discussion were that, and then quotes, the cladding should not contribute to the spread of fire and that the combustibility clause is intended to include all materials in the external wall, in bold, in the original. A an exception may be made for small, isolated components that would not contribute to fire spread. Now, uh, we, we know that you didn't attend the 17th of March 2016 CWCT fire group meeting, but we know that Sarah Colwell did. Were you aware of that meeting at the time? Um, I don't recall. I'm, I may have been. I don't know. Let's look at the minutes, please. CLG 30 is 19415. 19415. This is a copy of the minutes of that meeting, as you can see, and you can see who was present. Uh, uh, just looking at the first page of those minutes, th do they look familiar to you? No. No, I don't recall. Do you think you've... I've, I've seen them since. I've right. seen them um, prior, you know, in preparation for the public inquiry, so they're familiar in that sense, but I don't recall seeing them at the time. Do you remember having any discussions with Sarah Colwell before the meeting? Um, no, I don't. Do you remember having any discussion with Sarah Colwell after the meeting? No, I don't recall. Um, were you uh, aware of the content of BCA Technical Guidance Note 18, either in its 2014 iteration, issue naught, or its 2015 iteration, issue one? Um, again, it's something that I'm familiar with now, but I don't recall at what point I became familiar with it. Now, you can see here that uh, Brian Martin accepts, uh, that at least at that meeting, that 12.7 was misleading and had undertaken to change it in the next revision of, approved, of the approved document. Was that something that you ever discussed with him in the context of your discussions with him about the upcoming review of approved document B generally? Um, not that I can recall. I mean, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't typically have come and discussed other matters with us other than those that we were currently working on for them or for him. Did, did you not become aware at this time that Brian Martin, the government, Brian Martin, had accepted that paragraph 12.7 was misleading uh, and had undertaken to change it in the next iteration of the approved documents? I don't recall that at the time, no. Is that not something Sarah Colwell discussed with you after the meeting? Well, I say I don't recall. I don't recall that right. discussion explicitly. Do you know when you first learnt that Brian Martin had expressed the view that paragraph 12.7 of the approved document was misleading and required amendment? Uh, no, I don't. You don't. Do you not have any impression of learning his view about that at around this time, at 2016? Um, not explicitly, no. I don't. What about implicitly? I mean, I wasn't, um, I say, I, from 2016 onwards, I was working at a much greater distance from the day-to-day -day technical activities within the, um, within the areas. Um, my role was much more um, <coughs> overarching, um, with a much greater um, group of responsibility covering many other areas as well as fire and the fire safety aspects. Um, and I was not as directly involved in um, the day-to-day -day activities Right. When in 2016 did you start working at a much greater distance? Um, it would have been around this time. Oh. I took on the responsibility, I think, at the beginning of April. Right. And so from, I think it was from the December to the April, I was working closely with the um, previous managing director 
you know, to develop familiarity and sort of as a handover. Uh, Mr Chairman, we're going to turn to a different topic now. Uh, it's a few minutes before one o'clock. Well, if, if, I, I, mean, I could start the topic. Well, I, I think it'd be better not. And I have a question I'd like to follow yes. up on. I'm afraid it involves jobbing back a bit to the um, CWCT meeting in July 2014, which Sarah Colwell went to, mm -hmm. but you didn't. Yes. And it was the meeting at which, it, according to the minutes, she agreed to approach Brian Martin to. Uh, help him produce um, an FAQ. Do you remember Chair, that? Mr. Chairman, should I get that up on the screen? Well, I was going to, perhaps you could. It's, yes, it's, it's BRE, because I, I rather closed you down, I'm afraid, but it's BRE 402577, page 4. Um, all right, I've got it up on the different reference, but it's all <laughs> the same. If it's, right. Let's see if it comes up. Yes, now then, could, could you just expand the top? third of the document. That would be a help, please. There we are. It's the paragraph which begins, it was stated that Clause 12, 7 of ADB, etc. Do you remember that? Yes, yes. And um, <clears throat> it reflects a discussion at the meeting about the use of ACM uh, panels, as you can see in the second line, above 18 metres. Yes. And um, somebody said that 12.7 was intended to prohibit their use, but it's clear from what follows that that was not regarded as obvious to everyone in the meeting. Yes. It says this is not clear from the wording of the current clause, and then there's the reference to the heading, which it was suggested implies that it only applied to insulation. Yes. Yep. So at that <clears throat> point, it was clear to everyone at the meeting that there was if not around the table, perhaps there was around the table, but at least in the wider industry, different views about the, uh, about the compliance of ACM panels with 12.7. Yes, yes. And it was that difference of opinion which resulted in the suggestion there should be an FAQ. And one thing I'm interested to know is, uh, did Sarah Colwell on her return from the meeting, or in the days immediately following, tell you that there was this difference of opinion about the compliance of ACM panels? Um, I don't recall. I don't recall that at all. You, you see, the reason I ask is because I think she told us, and maybe you can confirm, that you and she worked in fairly close proximity to each other and would see a lot of each other on a regular but informal basis. Is that right? Um, I mean, in close proximity from, I think, 20, 2009, Sarah was actually located remote from the building that I was in. Right. So <clears throat> we weren't in close proximity. Right. We were in um, different buildings. Um, but as with, you know, all of the business group managers, I would have um, regular meetings with them around... KPIs and performance and, and so on. Um, you see, it seems to be slightly surprising that she had gone to the meeting, as she told us, with a view that, for whatever reason, 12.7 did cover the core of an ACM panel, mm -hmm. and you were of the same opinion, as you've told us, and, and there at the meeting it suddenly became apparent that that was not a view that was universally accepted. And if it were, for, for those who did not accept that view and were minded to use ACM panels, there was perhaps a very mm. serious risk of danger to life. Did, did that, she, she didn't report that to you at all? Or I don't recall that? that. I mean, I would have expected um, the discussion to have certainly taken place between Sarah and Brian on that point. If he, uh, as you said, wasn't there for the whole meeting, um, and, I mean, it may very well have been discussed with other members of the BRE team working in this particular area. So Tony Baker and Steve Howard. But as I say, I can't recall at the time us having had a discussion around this. Now, we know the FAQ saga went on for about six months with... Uh 
Mr. Metcalf chasing mm. Dr. Colwell yes, for response yeah. and so on and so forth. And throughout that period, no, she never mentioned to you that there was this rather important question that had arisen um, and what was going to be done about it. I say I don't recall at all. No. I, I, I just don't. Um, I'm sorry, I don't recall that. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Do you want to follow that up at all, Mr. Miller? Um, I, I might, but I just but want not to look at the transcript. No. Right. Thank you very much. Well, it's time we had a break for lunch. We'll stop there. We'll resume, please, at two o'clock. And uh, again, <laughs> please don't talk to anyone yes. about your evidence when they're out of the room. All right? yes. yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Two o'clock, Mr.